Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. Many of you have heard the health and wellness and science shows that we have done about the body this summer and last summer. And I've read a book called The Autoimmune Epidemic by Donna Jackson Nakazawa. Donna got 3,000 of the world's top scientists to bless and support her book. You absolutely have to get this book. Autoimmune diseases are more prevalent than you can imagine. 23.5 million people suffer from autoimmune disease. 80% of them, women, you're going to be surprised when you find out the role of toxins, environmental toxins, heavy metals, vaccinations. The list goes on and on. But the way Donna Jackson Nakazawa puts it together for us, she really stewards an incredible synthesis of discoveries and is leading in the world about the autoimmune epidemic. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Donna Jackson Nakazawa to its rainmaking time. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really, really pleased at what you've done in this book. It is so complete. We have a short amount of time today. And I think the first thing I want you to do is lay it out for us what an autoimmune disease is and what does it do in the body? Well, there are over 100 autoimmune diseases. First, I want to make that clear. And sometimes people really don't realize there's a little disconnect in terms of autoimmune disease. What is that? It's lupus. It's MS. It's um, rheumatoid arthritis. It's juvenile arthritis. It's type 1 diabetes. It's a lot of diseases that we tend to not even think about, thyroiditis, but they're all in one group because in all of these diseases, the body works in a similar way, and that is that the body's immune system becomes confused, and rather than just send out good antibodies to help fight disease through our white blood cells, we begin to produce something called autoantibodies. And auto means self. And the antibodies are the fighter cells that are going out to prevent us from having disease, whether it's a virus or bacteria or what have you. Well, autoantibodies, whether it's an autoantibody in thyroiditis or an autoantibody in rheumatoid arthritis, they attack the body itself, the organs and systems of the body itself. So in thyroiditis, we have our own immune system turning on our own thyroid. Rheumatoid arthritis, our own immune system is turning on the, the, and inflaming the joints and, and areas of the body where we see that kind of heavy inflammation. That's what autoimmune disease is. And it's over 100 different common, many of them common diseases, and we don't always realize that they fall under this one umbrella. Like Epstein-Barr, too, and Hashimoto's, right? Hashimoto's, Epstein-Barr is not, um, is not Epstein-Barr, if you're talking about Epstein-Barr as chronic fatigue, chronic fatigue is still being um, categorized by many different scientists as to whether or not it's falling under the autoimmune label. Many suspect that it is. Fibromyalgia, very similar. It's, um, they're still searching for the autoantibody that's at work. So, Scientists will not say that a disease is clinically an autoimmune process unless they can find the autoantibody that's turning on the body. But the relationship between autoimmune disease, chronic fatigue, and fibromyalgia is very, very distinct. There are multiple ways we can test for this. You named a couple for some of the diseases in the book, but is there a generic test available yet? No, there is not. Um, when autoimmune diseases started to be noticed in the population, no one really understood that they were an autoimmune process, again, an attack of self on self. In fact, um, there was a Nobel Prize winner who was quite famous for a saying called horror autotoxicus, which is that the body has a horror of turning on itself and it would never happen. And this pervaded medical theory way until the 1980s. In fact, it wasn't until the 1980s that the idea of autoimmune disease was really regularly taught in med schools because it took a long time 
um, as the great writer Thomas Kuhn says, to overturn the medical norm takes about 20 years. So even though research was going on, looking at autoantibodies in lab rabbits and showing how their autoantibodies were turning on their thyroids, and that was happening in the 50s and 60s, it wasn't until the 80s that doctors really understood autoimmune disease existed. Can you imagine if we didn't know cancer existed? (laughs) <laughs> and what caused, you know, how it worked in the body with tumors until the 1980s? Well, that's the situation with autoimmune disease. We knew people were getting sick with arthritis. We knew people were getting sick with their thyroids. We knew they were getting sick with neurological autoimmune diseases, I mean, neurological diseases like MS. But the idea that they're all one pathway, that they all happen the same way, is very late out of the gate. What that means is that all the different areas, so rheumatoid arthritis and other um, arthritic autoimmune diseases and rheumatological autoimmune diseases, they were patients who had already been co-opted and were all being seen by a specific group of specialists, the rheumatologists. People with neurological disorders we're all already being seen by the neurologist and so on down the line. So there was no getting together at the top of the mountain by these different specialists. And they're saying, okay, all these people actually have a very similar disease. I say that because it's important to understand when we ask ourselves, well, we have this epidemic. We are, you know, at a place where we should be much further along in terms of understanding and treating it, well, we're not in part because the discovery was late and all of the different groups of medical specialists had already taken over on these areas of research and there is no single test for autoimmunity. If you have neurological symptoms, there are a number of different tests that doctors will do often through, unfortunately, spinal taps to find out if you have certain um, assays uh, and biomarkers for MS, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and so on down the line. There are a set of autoantibody tests for rheumatoid arthritis and other arthritic autoimmune diseases and so on down the line. Having said that, there can probably never be one test for autoimmune disease because each part of the body in which there is an autoantibody at work, is that autoantibody is going to look extremely different given the area of the body where it's working and the disease that it is causing. Does that make any sense? It makes total sense. So then what it really tells us is that the action is in prevention, prevention, prevention. Let's talk about vaccinations. There's new knowledge now that is being gathered by many people, both researchers and many doctors, about the complexity and some of the dangers of vaccinating that was never taken into account before in the autoimmune epidemic. You talk about vaccinations and how they may trigger autoimmune responses. Can you talk about that? Well, sure I can. But first, just a little disclaimer in that the majority of vaccinations that we receive um, today, if they're done carefully and under consideration by a really good physician, especially I'm talking about children who isn't going to overwhelm them at any one time with too many vaccines, is going to do it in in the right time frame. I do have to step forward and say this is very complicated. If we stopped giving a number of those childhood vaccines, we would see far greater deaths from some of these other diseases than we see from autoimmune disease. So it isn't, people can't look at it as a black and white picture. Understood. None of us want to see polio come back. Understood. None of us us want to see kids dying from rubella. So, So I have to be very clear about that. I am a science reporter. I have seen the statistics on how many lives we save with vaccination. I'll tell you right now, I vaccinated my children. Okay. So, (laughs) because I understand what happens if, if we don't have those vaccines. Now, at the same time, if there are optional vaccines, then some of those I'm going to step away from because what happens in the vaccination process is that at the same time a vaccine is, is, 
potentially saving a life in the future. It is exciting the immune 